British tycoon joins the cryptocurrency craze and regulators start to sweat. Welcome to Deep Dive. I'm Mary Anastasio Grady from the Wall Street Journal. This week, a group of investors, including Alphabet, known to most as Google, and Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Atlantic, launched a new exchange that promises to process digital currency transactions like Bitcoin in microseconds. The new product comes from blockchain, which was born in 2011 and has evolved as a place to store and trade digital currency. The new exchange will be called The Pit, and its founders are hoping that it will draw more users to digital currency. And that means that legislators and bureaucrats cannot be far behind with the aim of more regulation. So today we dive into the world of cryptocurrencies. We will explore what they are, what gives them value, how they work, and we will analyze their place in a free and just society. With me today to discuss are Diego Zuloaga, a policy analyst at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, Kristen Smith, the director of blockchain, at, at the Blockchain Association, and Will Luther, economics professor at Florida Atlantic University, and director of the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Will, I'd like to start with you because I think to get this conversation going, really what we need is uh, a little bit about what um, uh, a digital currency is and why would anyone want to own one? Well, uh, a digital currency or a cryptocurrency is really two things. First, it's a digital asset that you can use to uh, make transactions. And second, it's a mechanism to transfer that digital asset. So with Bitcoin, for example, we have the balance of Bitcoin, which you might use to make purchases with. And we have the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a shared ledger where uh, every balance of Bitcoin that exists is uh, listed. And, uh, uh, and it's a mechanism so that uh, when a Bitcoin transaction gets made, we debit one of those accounts and credit another. So if, you, if you'd like, I can be a bit more concrete. Suppose I wanted to buy my lunch with uh, Bitcoin. Um, so I would uh, issue a transaction request to send a balance of Bitcoin to the restaurant. And then all of the other users running the Bitcoin protocol uh, would essentially race to be the first to uh, update this uh, ledger um, so that it now reflects that I have less Bitcoin in my account and the restaurant has more Bitcoin uh, in their account. Well, so does that mean, and that's, I guess, what they call mining, <laughs> right, when they update the ledger. So, Diego, does that mean that um, uh, the Bitcoin has a, 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 there's a, there's a finite number of Bitcoin in the world, and that way when more people want to buy it, it goes up in value, and when fewer people want it, it goes down? Or are new Bitcoins always being made? So there is a fixed supply, which we haven't reached quite yet. I mean, the expectation is that sometime in the 2020s, we will get to the maximum 21 million coins that are the set maximum in the Bitcoin protocol. But I think in addition to what Will just said, uh, something important to note about Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. And what I mean by that is that there's no central intermediary, no central counterparty running the system. Typically, when making payments online, until 2008 when Bitcoin was first developed and launched, um, you had someone in the middle who would ensure that the person sending the funds actually had them and that the person receiving actually received them because there would be an exchange of goods and services and without that intermediary function, we couldn't be sure that someone wasn't promising the funds to several different people at the same time. Now, the great innovation of Bitcoin is to create a system by which you can verify that without having anyone sitting in the middle verifying everything and that's the process of mining. So people are competing, expending a lot of electricity and computing power, um, competing with each other, and whoever wins this contest, which involves resolving a mathematical problem, will get a reward as a result of that. Now, what you do with that is you encourage virtuous behavior because these people, these quote-unquote miners, are encouraged to do things right, to fulfill the true transactions and to verify that these people are actually behaving in a, in, in a proper way, not trying to fake their way into the system. Uh, but then secondly, it... Uh, it uh, um, supplies additional coins uh, until we reach the limit. I mean, we will never really reach the limit because the, the rewards will always keep decreasing over time. But the hope is that by the time we get very close to the limit, the system will be large enough that mining is still rewarded by transaction fees. 
And I think I want to build on something Diego said. So eliminating the middleman, this really is the fundamental innovation here. And with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is really uh, a simple digital way to move value on the internet. And that, that is um, a, a very basic use case. What we're seeing as cryptocurrencies are evolving and new ideas are coming forward is we're taking these same concepts that Bitcoin have that allow this more direct interaction and we're seeing it apply to other digital services like content services, social media services, um, gaming services. So it's, it's really a revolutionary technology that's not only going to change the way that we do financial services going forward, but it's going to change a whole host of digital services okay. that we have online. Before we, so you're a little bit ahead of me because I think I'm still in the, in the very rudimentary phases of this. Let's just talk about this ledger because we're, what's confusing to me and I think maybe to some of our audience is where does this ledger exist? I mean, you're saying that it's, there's no intermediary, but it's somewhere out there in cyberspace? So this is the interesting thing, Mary, is that it actually exists in lots of places at exactly the same time. So if we think about the way transactions have been processed in the past, like digital transactions, you swipe your debit card, right? The bank is uh, clearing that transaction, right? It's a, uh, uh, a third party to the transaction that debits your account and credits mine. Exactly. But that means that we have to trust that the bank will only process uh, the transactions that we authorize and not process transactions we don't authorize. But it also means that we have to trust that bank with uh, our personal information, who we are, where we live, uh, what kind of transactions we're making. Uh, when, when Bitcoin transactions are processed, they don't rely on some trusted third party like your bank. Instead, uh, that ledger, a copy of that ledger, is kept on lots of computers, and the Bitcoin protocol is just a mechanism such that when one person updates that ledger, all of the other computers okay. with that shared ledger have an ability to say, yes, that's a, a legitimate update. And so we're going to update our ledger to reflect that as well. Okay. And so we process transactions, uh, to use the technical term, in a, a distributed way as opposed to using a central clearinghouse like a, a bank. Well, um, sometimes people talk about Bitcoin like it could replace uh, the money that central banks produce. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, all three of you can tell me what you think of that. But it, in a general sense, I think, look, I buy a Bitcoin because I think I'm going to buy my lunch with it tomorrow. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin is worth something totally different mm. than what I thought it was worth today. That happens with our money, but not in the kind of volatile swings that Bitcoin has gone through. So I guess one of my questions would, to you would be, what's to stop um, what's, what protects the owner against like a sharp devaluation of what they think is kind of a store of value in a medium in exchange for them? Well, I would say Bitcoin is, is volatile, but you have to remember Bitcoin's only been around for a little bit over 10 years and it's the very early stages. And well, there are applications and ways to spend Bitcoin Right now, Bitcoin is functioning to be quite a bit more like gold than it is as a replacement for the dollar. And so over time, we will see potentially more vendors, um, different software systems online, dif different situations where people might be spending Bitcoin on a more regular basis. But today, most people that, that buy Bitcoin do it to, um, there's a phrase called hodl. It was a sort of a misspelling of hold that people in the Bitcoin community use. People are buying and holding and, and they are speculating with it. But I think over time, we're going to see Bitcoin evolve in how it's used. And we're also going to see other cryptocurrencies come in that um, serve different functions and different purposes. So are you saying, uh, sorry, just to finish, uh, follow up on that though, are you saying that um, your expectation is that over time as other products come on the, online that the volatility, the volatility problem, as I would call it, will will diminish? I think there are a lot in the community that think over time that Bitcoin will stabilize. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's kind of like we see gold is sort of roughly stable. You still see fluctuations, um, but that, that it is sort of a long-term store of value that can be um, a hedge against other things that are out there. So, so yeah, today it's, it's not 
super useful for your everyday consumer. Um, there are not many shops that you can go into and, and buy your cup of coffee or your sandwich um, with Bitcoin, but there are some providers, um, Overstock, you can go buy a toaster on Overstock and pay with Bitcoin. And so they're, they're, um, a lot of people are still experimenting and it, it is very, really the early days of this, okay. of this technology. Yeah. Did you, sorry, you, did you wanna say something Well, I was, just, I was just going to go back to your question about what protects the user or the owner of Bitcoin from a sharp devaluation. There's no guarantee that Bitcoin will be worth anything at any point in time. However, I would say that a lot of the people who hold Bitcoin do believe that the system is efficient at doing what it's supposed to do, at doing what it says on the tin, which is the transfer of funds without an intermediary. And so a lot of people who are holding uh, are the sort of people who believe that this network will become greater over time, will become a legitimate um, payments network of some uh, description or a basis on which other kinds of financial services and other kinds of transactions can be facilitated and therefore that there will be some uh, increase or stability uh, you know because people only care about volatility when it's downside volatility <laughs> right um, you know that that will make the network appreciate uh, in in value in terms of the money question I would agree with Kristen that um, Bitcoin looks more like a commodity what that means is that in terms of becoming a generally accepted medium of exchange, which is the typical definition of money, something that people will generally take as a means of exchange when acquiring goods and services, it faces a bit of a challenge because people like network effects, that is, people like uh, currencies that other people also accept. That's mm -hmm. why the U.S. dollar is so uh, popular as a currency, not only in America, but around the world. But people also like stability of purchasing power. Uh, particularly in the short term, right? I think people can deal, even though it's uh, in some ways suboptimal, people can deal with 2% annual inflation or even 5% annual inflation. But on a day-to-day -day basis, to have a volatility of 10 15%, if you're a merchant and you're posting your prices every morning and you expect that kind of volatility during the day, it's going to make your transactions much more expensive. So in terms of uh, Bitcoin becoming the actual unit that people use to transact, I think it will take... Uh, a large evolution in terms of a banking system that takes on Bitcoin and, you know, what the associated um, it, it issue issue policy is when you're issuing banknotes and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's much more complex. Than but looking think. further out in time, are you suggesting that um, credit might be issued from Bitcoin the same way that you get credit in dollars, that you could get credit in Bitcoin and... You could imagine, particularly in, in, particularly in places where the domestic mm. fiat currency has lost a lot of value over time, there's no reason in particularly where you have controls on what other fiat currencies can be used. So, for example, in China or in Venezuela, where the central bank and the government prevent people from acquiring foreign currencies, you could imagine that something that avoids those kinds of capital controls could become a popular substitute. Uh, and you could even have debt contracts come up in, in mm -hmm, Bitcoin mm -hmm. if Bitcoin is more stable uh, okay. than, uh, than, okay. than the domestic. Okay, before we move on to a uh, little bit more about what it's used for, I just want to uh, ask maybe, Will, you can uh, talk to us a little bit about um, how the universe of Bitcoin either grows larger. I mean, Diego mentioned that by 2022 mm. or something, it, they'll meet their maximum. So between now and then, more Bitcoins are going to be created and they're created as a reward for those who update the ledger. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, you know, this kind of takes us back to the mining issue. Um, so let, let me first say that I think we should be careful when we're comparing Bitcoin to, to gold. You know, the beauty of a classical gold standard is that when the purchasing power of gold went up, you know, people want to hold more gold money, uh, this gave an incentive, uh, an incentive for miners to dig a little deeper, to bring more gold to mint, to have uh, more coins, so then to expand the supply to accommodate that demand. And so over the long run, what you saw was that the purchasing power of gold was pretty stable because there's this built-in mechanism to adjust the supply. Now, Bitcoin also has a supply mechanism, uh, but it's a very different supply mechanism. Roughly every 10 minutes, a batch of transactions is processed. Uh, it's costly to process that batch of transactions. A lot of electricity. Electricity, yeah. you have to uh, use some wear and tear on your machine. And so as an incentive, there's some new Bitcoin that is generated every time a batch of transactions uh, is processed. And that uh, balance of new Bitcoin is given to the, the person who processes the transactions. And so uh, roughly every 10 minutes, some new Bitcoin enters the system. Okay. Uh, for the first four years, that was uh, 50 Bitcoin 
uh, every 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, and then it was halved to 20, 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and now it's 12 and a half. Uh, and it will keep uh, being halved roughly every four years until the reward falls to zero. And so that is a supply mechanism which is predetermined. Um, it's, it's built into what it means to be Bitcoin. Um, but it doesn't expand and contract to offset changes in demand like a like okay. a classical gold standard would. It's just a fixed growth. So if there's a lot of demand, it, the price is going to go up because you can't create any more Bitcoin at some point. That's right. right. So if you if you're comparing it to something like uh, gold coins, right? Uh, uh, gold coins were uh, relatively volatile over the short run, but in the long run, when the supply can adjust, it's relatively stable. Uh, in, with Bitcoin, it's relatively volatile in the, in the short run, but there's no built-in mechanism to cause a supply adjustment that would mm -hmm. uh, bring us back to some long-run expected purpose. Okay, one more question about uh, the value of the, of the Bitcoin. And there are, we should make clear to our audience that there are a number of different uh, cryptocurrencies and digital currencies at this time. Bitcoin is kind of the Kleenex of uh, <laughs> the currency world. But um, what I'm wondering is um, why, do you have any speculation, any of you, of why we saw that huge run-up in the value of Bitcoin? I mean, I think it went from 3,000, it went up to as much as 20,000 at one point, and then came down to around nine or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, that's obviously a, a, you know, as we say on Wall Street, more buyers than sellers. But um, why? Why did it run up like that? What were people thinking? Mm. I, th I think a lot of it was just awareness. There was, um, you know, Bitcoin's been around for a while. It was at the beginning uh, sort of a bunch of geeky hobbyists that were um, interacting and, and doing this. And that there really was a greater consumer awareness of Bitcoin that happened that sort of People wanted to be a part of it and own it, and there were these sort of get-rich-quick schemes. I think it was sort of a classic um, bubble, and then that sort like of... Like a tulip craze? Uh, it was a little bit of a tulip craze, but it's, it's now, you know, sort of leveled out. It, uh, um, you know, there was what we called the crypto winner, where prices were relatively low, um, which is actually a good thing for the broader industry, because it kind of pushed the... Uh, the people who weren't sort of serious and educated out and allowed sort of a rebuilding of, um, of uh, people who understood Bitcoin, but also other areas in the industry. And we're starting to see, see that um, sort of steadily rise again. So I'm, you know, there's a million factors that go into prices, but right, I, I think sure. just yeah. the, the public That's awareness was, yeah. was something that I think that. I think also the realization that the technology could be much more widely applied, perhaps, than might have been initially thought. Mm -hmm. Because when Bitcoin was first released, and this was an un well, a pseudonymous paper that came out by a guy or a group of people, a, a, a man or woman or a group of people, uh, who called themselves Satoshi Nakamoto. And he proposed a, quote, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So electronic cash that is not intermediated by anybody. That came out in late 2008. The network went live in 2009. For the first few years, it was only Bitcoin. But as the people who started paying attention to Bitcoin realized the possibilities for implementing this for other things, for exchanging computing power, for sharing computer storage online, for managing uh, trade finance and various other kind of databases, decentralizing that kind of activity, uh, I think th there, was, there was a realization that there was a business case for this that was much wider than than previously. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we went to, as Kristen described, people jumping, jumping on the bandwagon and calling all things blockchain, uh, even the ones that didn't use that kind of technology. And, uh, and I, I guess some people got burnt. But um, uh, what the Bitcoin fans would respond is that Bitcoin is still much more valuable today, a unit of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. than it was in 2013 or 2014. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Okay, let's move on to what we use this for, because that's a, a fascinating world, I think. Um, starting out with this idea of financial privacy. Um, you know, my, um, my, my, my libertarian side thinks, wow, this is great, you know, do these things without Big Brother looking at you. But there's also the question of why would anybody who's not a criminal want to use this? I mean, it's, it, what, what I think a lot of politicians and bureaucrats are worrying about is that it, transnational crime will get into this because there's an anonymity about it and so forth. So maybe you could talk a little bit about 
who besides criminals will use uh, this, or will, will be drawn to this idea of privacy? So let me push back against the premise to start with, that okay. uh, the idea that we shouldn't endorse a currency that is used by criminals. Uh, unfortunately, not all laws are good laws, and not all criminals are bad criminals. Uh, there are some places around the world where it is illegal to uh, to fund the opposition political party. Mm -hmm. to, Russia. Yeah. yeah. So if if you're in this environment and you uh, you know you use your means to organize a, a peaceful protest or to to fund some political advertisements, you're uh, at some serious risks there, uh, and so uh, that is a crime. <laughs> but, I see, I see. But folks okay. like you and I, we, yeah. we think, no, no, that's just yeah. democracy. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, they give some scope for those uh, li li uh, liberty enhancing um, uh, activities. That There's we might also be the idea of anonymous donors, right? That's right. And you know, if we think about here in the U.S., right, um, uh, marijuana distributors, for example, uh, legal in many states, but still illegal at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And many of those businesses find it very difficult to open bank accounts because the banks are, are worried right. about being charged with uh, money laundering. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's an application where there's uh, a legal gray area. Are these mm -hmm. folks criminals or not criminals? Well, it depends on whether you're asking the state government or the, or the federal government. But even in, in transactions that, that no one would see as nefarious, right? Maybe, uh, maybe you want to uh, uh, provide some, some support for a neighbor who's fallen on hard times. You don't want them to feel obligated to, to repay that. Um, maybe you are, are purchasing a gift for a spouse or, uh, and you uh, don't want the transaction to show up on a, a debit card or, or bank statement. Um, uh, maybe you're, uh, uh, you know, you're uh, dealing with a, a merchant that you don't know very well and you want to limit the extent to which you're vulnerable to identity theft. Mm -hmm. These are all transactions and there are many more where you and I might want access to a quasi-anonymous payment mechanism like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And what about data? I mean, is there a, a, a data privacy issue? Well, uh, it's possible to open a, a Bitcoin account without revealing your personal information. Mm -hmm. And so that if you do that um, and you make transactions, then you don't have to worry so much about your, your uh, personal information being revealed because you've never revealed that. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, if people know the transactions you're making, then they can trace those transactions back to your identity. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, financial privacy, um, uh, much more private than, say, a, a bank account, um, perhaps less private than hand-to-hand uh, -hand currency or cash. Okay. Paradoxically, it's also more efficient at uh, identifying the people who are truly criminals. Because, uh, as Will mentioned earlier, there's this blockchain, this public ledger, which is publicly available and anyone can download it. And it has a bunch of letters and numbers in it. It doesn't have people's actual names, but these are unique identifiers, like a username for people making transactions on the network. And everybody can see it. So law enforcement agencies love it when criminals use Bitcoin uh, to engage in criminal activity because they can very easily trace it back uh, to them. So this idea that this is somehow, it's not anonymous, first of all, it's pseudonymous, right? Meaning you, uh, you adopt an identity different from the one that you have in real life, uh, but it's still your identity and it's unique to you. Um, of course, there are other ways that people engage in criminal activity, and the foremost among them is the use of cash. And it's, this has been going back, yeah. uh, you know, centuries, uh, and it doesn't prompt policymakers to try to, uh, to abolish cash one day to the next, or at least the ones who are sensible because they realize that a lot of valuable economic activity wouldn't happen as a result. And I think a similar argument applies uh, to cryptocurrencies. There are yeah, I mean, I, I think if I, if I were taking the other side of that argument, I would say that, for example, when it comes to um, uh, transnational crime, particularly by terrorists, they want to move money around the world. And, um, you know, governments want a way to, you know, follow them and, and and track them down. So I guess that's the um, counter argument to the privacy. So Just here's the no. thing, though. You know, <laughs> terrorists and international drug cartels, they already have very effective ways of moving money around the world without being detected. Uh, so this technology is really a, a technology for the rest of us. And I would say that, you know, I give credit to the Treasury Department. They came out very early back in 2013 with their Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is the part of Treasury that does anti-money laundering policy. And they put 
regulations in place for the on-ramps, these uh, exchanges that allow people to get in and out of um, purchasing cryptocurrency. And so there is a lot of policies that are in place that help law enforcement, along with very specialized technology service providers that know how to go through the blockchain and forensically analyze it, that, that there is actually a really nice balance between being able to go after the bad guys, but also protect the good well, guys that's who rightfully need yeah. privacy in their transactions. Let's, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Let's go to this idea of, I think we'll start it out talking about how you have the Bitcoin, but you also have this blockchain technology, because that's what I hear a lot of people talking about, that the Bitcoin is something that will watch it evolve, but there's so many other uses and, and the, the platform technology is so important for the future. Maybe, Diego, you can tell us a little bit about what, I mean, where is this, what kinds of things other than just the Bitcoin trading can happen through that? So one thing to note at the outset is that everybody now uses databases. Everybody uses ways of recording huge amounts of electronic data. And we want that data to be updated almost as quickly as things change. We want it to be secure. And we want it to uh, only store the things that are important and retain privacy for, for the users to the greatest extent possible, right? While also complying with applicable laws. So there are a lot of very conflicting objectives. And we're struggling, I think, sometimes, uh, particularly large corporates sometimes struggle to meet all of those requirements. You know, every once in a while we'll have news of data breaches, uh, people dealing with updating their personal information when they're dealing with particular vendors or merchants often, you know, complain about how long it takes and the many mistakes that people make and so on. The promise of using something like blockchain technology for this is that you take advantage of some of the decentralized features of the technology to better meet those requirements that people have of databases. Because you have so many people involved in it, a lot of people are paying attention in the first place, but people also have an economic incentive to update information as quickly as possible. That's the first application. The second item is, more broadly, blockchain is one type of what's called a quote-unquote distributed ledger. That is no more than a database that is shared by a large group of people where that large group of people can make updates to it. The hope is that even individual firms within the firm can use the technology to improve their processes. So even if the ledger is distributed but only accessible to a few people, say the, the people who work within the firm, that holds uh, efficiencies. And we have large corporates running trials to, uh, to apply the technology to their own uh, activities. Some examples are IBM, Amazon, JP Morgan. Uh, so it's definitely uh, capturing a lot of attention. It will take some time, but so did the internet. Yeah, yeah. So there's real future there in the in the technology. We're really running out of time, but I have to go to Kristen because you're in Washington and you deal with the regulatory world. Um, where where are we with regulation on this? Are we running behind? I know that if we don't keep up, other countries are going to. There's some fear that other countries are going to become more the leaders in the technology, and we wouldn't want that, would we? Well, yeah, unfortunately, it's already happening. Um, we've seen Switzerland, Singapore, um, even uh, the UK, and some smaller countries have put in frameworks because the challenge is whether it's Bitcoin or um, many of these other cryptocurrencies that are evolving is they don't, they all have unique characteristics and they don't always fit neatly within existing regulatory categories that we have today. So there's a lot of uncertainty here in the United States. And as a result, a lot of um, services that are available internationally aren't available here. A lot of tokens that are traded around the world aren't traded here in the U.S. And, you know, the... The U.S. has laid the groundwork on a couple of fronts, by, especially, as I mentioned, on the anti-money laundering front, but we've fallen behind in other areas, and so Congress is starting to get involved. There were um, three hearings uh, between the House and the Senate in the month of July. Members are trying to wrap their heads around the technology, figure out what needs to happen, because this is, we believe, to be the next driver of innovation um, mm -hmm. in our economy mm -hmm. as we go into the next decade. And we want to make sure that the U.S. continues to be a leader in financial services and technology. Well, I have to say that the world